Well, good afternoon and welcome to the penultimate presentation of Dawn or Doom 2018. If you were at the previous presentation, you were at the anti-penultimate presentation. This one's the one before the last one. Everybody's very tired, apparently. Uh, and this is being presented by Christina Warren. Why developers and their users need to talk. So Christina Warren is a journalist and podcaster and speaker known for her coverage of technology, new media, and popular culture. You could say that her job was explaining emerging technologies and their effects to an audience not made up of, for the most part, technologists. Now, among other things, she's creating opportunities for technologists to explain themselves in mutually illuminating and beneficial conversations with the users of their technology. A senior cloud developer advocate for Microsoft, she helped shape the overall content of Channel 9, a video-heavy website designed to inspire Microsoft and its customers to talk in an honest and human voice. She hosts many Channel 9 shows, interviewing developers, sharing the latest development news, and more. She also helps shape docs.microsoft.com, Microsoft's developer site, and the work of the company's cloud development ag advocacy team in general. Prior to joining Microsoft, Warren spent a decade in digital media as an editor, senior reporter, and commentator with a focus on technology, business, and entertainment, working for USA Today, Mashable, and Gizmodo, among others. She has appeared as an expert or commentator on ABC, NBC, CBS, CNN, CNBC, Fox News, Fox Business, Bloomberg, the BBC, Marketplace Radio, The Today Show, Good Morning America, and believe it or not, more. <laughs> she has also starred as Selfie Girl in a music video by the indie rock band Airplane Mode. Today she'll present a talk entitled Why Developers and Their Users Need to Talk. So please let me ask you to take a moment to silence your devices. Uh, but don't hesitate to tweet using hashtag Dawn or Doom Artists from the Int Factory will be creating visual recaps, as they have for the last two days, of the talks from our presenters. And you're welcome to take pictures after and share them on social media. Don't be afraid to chat with the artist and ask questions when she's finished drawing. Uh, just as a mechanical thing, Christine is going to talk for about 40 to 45 minutes. Then she will invite questions from the floor. If you would like to ask a question, please go to one of these two mics since we're recording and we'd like to be able to hear the question for posterity. Uh, about five minutes before the end of the hour, I will go to the back of one of the lines and then we'll just finish with the people who are in the line at that point and then we'll call it a, a wrap, all right? So please welcome Christina Warren. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for that introduction. And uh, <laughs> I'm embarrassed because I didn't realize that all of my uh, TV credits were going to uh, be read. And as we'll kind of talk about as I explain what I used to do and what I do now and why, I think that it's so important that tech companies and uh, talk to both their, their developers and the developers talk to their users. Um, it'll, it'll kind of make sense that I used to basically go on, on TV. Is my mic OK? I'm, Feedback. Yeah, let me see if I can adjust this. All right, is this any better or is this better? Yeah. Okay, okay. All right. Excellent. Let, let me know if, if, if that changes. Um, no, but you know, I uh, I used to go on TV a lot to kind of explain things. Um, usually, why the world. Basically, news networks would call me and say. There's this, this tech story, and um, it's the end of the world, and we want you to come on and explain to us why this is either the end of the world or not. And usually the case would be that it was not, and uh, they would be very disappointed because it's much more exciting if it's the end of the world, um, which is kind of prescient. Sorry, I'm trying to just adjust this to get... 
make sure it's not hitting anything. Um, it makes it kind of prescient for speaking at dawn or doom because so much of what our technology, uh, the, the stories that happen around our technology and around the things that we're building and then communicating to users comes down to, is this going to ultimately doom us? Uh, have I been hacked? Is, do I have to reset all my passwords? Uh, is this, this new innovative technology eventually going to you know, outsource humans? And, and is this going to lead to maybe, maybe another war? I mean, there are all kinds of open questions. And so, um, as I said, though, usually the answer would be when I would go on TV that unfortunately, no, the world was not ending. And sometimes things would be really bad, but in general, uh, it's, uh, it, it's been fine. So I wanted to talk a little bit about who I am, and, and you heard my introduction, but um, my role at Microsoft, and I work uh, as a, a cloud developer advocate, and we kind of, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about what that role is in a second, but the TLDR is that we kind of sit between the people who are building the products and our users and our communities. And we're basically, oftentimes, uh, most of the members of the team are engineers, are people who are experts in uh, the, the disciplines that they, that they focus on and the audiences and the communities that they talk to. And our goal is basically to connect the, the users and the customers and the communities with the product team so that we can get feedback to the product team so that they can make things better and, and improve things uh, all up. And so, um, but before I joined Microsoft, I've been there almost a year and a half. And, sorry, I'm trying to, this is awkward, okay. <laughs> um, before I joined Microsoft, I spent a decade in digital media and I was a business and technology journalist. And it's, it's sort of interesting because as a journalist, I was probably one of the more technical journalists, especially for someone who was writing for more mainstream publications. Um, I've always been interested in, in software development, and I was building websites when I was in middle school, and I've, I've studied that sort of thing off and on. Um, it wasn't something that I, I, I did actually consider majoring in computer science in college. I didn't, um, but it was something that's always been an interest of mine, and, and those communities and, and the, the people who build apps uh, are, have always been people that I've naturally kind of gravitated towards and who've been my friends. And what's sort of interesting is that now I actually work at a tech company and I'm in a technical role, but most of my colleagues are far more technical than I am. So it's, it's kind of been an interesting switch to go from being one of the more technical people writing about things to being less technical than a lot of my peers, but learning all the time and, and, and um, really kind of having the opportunity to dive deep into um, aspects of code and, and of, our, of our products uh, that I didn't know before. And so, um, but, but you know, I used to, I wrote about a lot of different things uh, across business and technology um, and, and entertainment as well, usually talking about kind of uh, big picture analyses, uh, oftentimes trend reporting, looking at, uh, you know, reviewing products and also explaining things. And so I kind of wanted to, to show, you know, this is something that I wrote in 2011 this is what I used to do. And this was when I worked at uh, Mashable and <laughs> this, uh, this terrible image, the, the, uh, the cloud computing, the layperson's guide to distributed networks. And this was a post that I wrote in, what is that? Is that, Aug uh, yeah, August of 2011. So seven years ago, and this was basically a for dummies version of, of cloud computing and distributed uh, networks because it was becoming one of the buzzwords du jour and, and people wanted to understand it. And so, you know, it was my job to kind of write that, but for businesses or marketing people or just general, uh, uh, you know, readers who are wanting to know why am I hearing about this all the time. So now I kind of want to show a little bit about what I do now. And this, is, this, is, uh, this uh, example comes from um, a, um, let's see. Hi, I'm Christina Warren, Senior Cloud Developer Advocate, and today we're going to be talking about Microsoft Azure, which is a private and public cloud platform. If you've used Azure, you're familiar with the services it provides to developers and IT administrators to build, deploy, and manage applications. So whether you're already a pro or you're just getting started, let's take a quick look at what happens behind the scenes. Okay, so Azure uses a technology known as virtualization. Totally the same thing, right? 
So what that video was for is we have a, a new platform at Microsoft called Microsoft Learn, and it's part of our, our documentation site. So if you go to Microsoft.com slash learn, uh, we basically have a lot of uh, modules to get people up to speed and to teach them how to do various things on our services. And some of those are really advanced, some of them are entry level, and we have videos and docs and hands-on labs that go along with all of those pieces. You don't have to take you know, the learning in any particular order. You can skip around if you just want to watch one video or, or you know, uh, read some docs to get an answer to something, that's fine. Um, if you want to just try something out, you can do that too. And um, that video that, that I just showed was one that actually debuted, I guess, at the end of, of uh, September at uh, Ignite, our, our big conference for um, uh, IT uh, professionals and, and devops -y type of people. And when I, it was, it was interesting because when they were starting to launch the, the platform, they were looking for people to, you know, be the host and, and read, uh, uh, from a teleprompter as I did to explain basically how virtualization worked. And, you know, um, and I, I did a lot of those videos. And, and at first, you know, I was kind of like, I had deja vu. I was like, have I done this before? And then I looked back and I realized, oh yeah, I used to tell the same sort of story, but for a different audience. And so, um, although my job now is really different than what I used to do, there are some similarities. And uh, I think that this is an increasing thing that's happening um, in media. As the media business contracts and as you know, digital platforms um, start to feel the push that the traditional platforms have felt for years, you know, journalists are having to look at other ways you know, to, to, have, to, to, to make a living. And at the same time, you start to see tech companies and other um, big companies starting to see that there's value in having people who have a journalism background or who are good at communications on their teams, especially when it comes to um, talking to their, to their users. And the traditional route of this usually goes is that you work as a journalist and then you get hired someplace as uh, you know, internal communications or PR for an agency. And, and you, rather than being the journalist who interacts with the PR people who pitch you, you become the PR person who pitches the journalist. And we've seen that happen uh, for years, but uh, now the trend is weirdly, and I've had so many phone calls since I made the transition to, to working at a tech company, people taking roles at tech companies and not necessarily communications roles. Um, uh, like I said, I work in product. Uh, my technical title is senior content engineer. Now, I would not feel comfortable calling myself an, an engineer in the traditional sense, um, but that is, that is what I am, and I am engineering content, and I am working with the, the people who are building uh, tools each and every day. So um, what's been interesting to me, and I think that what kind of appealed to me about the role and, and what I kind of want to talk about is the idea that right now when we um, think about the big things that are happening in, in the world. And when we look at technology companies and when we look at all of the different changes that are happening, there is a sense, and I think rightly so, of distrust from the end user. And whether that is the developers who are building the products or that is the customers who are using the services or some amalgamation of the two, there is um, kind of a, a, a thing where we look at a lot of these big companies who have an immense amount of power, who have um, an immense amount of... Um, influence over uh, future directions of, of not just, uh, you know, how technology moves, but, but even democracies, and uh, as we've seen with, with various elections and, and, um, and social movements, and, and uh, the impact is, is, is massive. And when we look at things like um, artificial intelligence and machine learning, and you start to think about, you know, how uh, a biased model could have very real impacts on, um, you know, something like parole or uh, making decisions about whether or not to grant someone a loan, you start to kind of think about the, the broader implications about how much trust do users have in these companies and how much trust do developers who are building on these platforms have. And I think this is when it becomes crucial for us to start having communications and why it's crucial for the two sides and frankly all three groups to kind of talk together because the only way that we can truly make things better and, and, and making them better both from a product standpoint, making the, the things easier to use so that we can build better things and make better tools for humanity, but also you know, push back and, and, and have dialogues about what's happening and how comfortable people are or are not with certain features is to talk. And historically, um, What's kind of existed in the tech world is this idea of evangelism. And that has morphed in the last couple of years into an idea of advocacy. And when I joined Microsoft and when I joined the, the, the Cloud Advocate team, at first, in my mind, I, I thought that they were kind of synonymous. I thought it was a semantical 
uh, distinction. You know, whether you call me an evangelist or you call me an advocate, it's the same thing, right? I'm basically advocating on behalf of, you know, uh, 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 I'm spreading the gospel about, about our tools and products and letting people know what's happening. No. Um, the two aren't the same, and that isn't to say that people who've had the role of evangelist couldn't just as easily have the role as advocate today. But I think that there is a very uh, distinct uh, difference between the role of someone who's evangelizing and the role of someone who's advocating. So the way that I see advocacy, for instance, is I'm not advocating on behalf of Microsoft. Obviously, I want people to use our products and I want them to, to offer feedback and, and to like them and, and ultimately that will be you know, good for the business. Um, I, I want them to like the things that we make. But really, the way I see my role is that I'm advocating for the users and the developers in this case so that if they're not able to do what they need to do with our tools, I can go back to the product teams and let that be known and work on, on, on making fixes and making changes. Or if there is a reason why we can't do something that might fit their needs, I can at least communicate what that is and again pass that feedback on to the people who are actually building the products. So I see myself as advocating for the developer, for the end user, not necessarily advocating for the company. Obviously, like I said, you know, it's, I have a job at Microsoft. I work you know, ultimately for Microsoft, but the way I view my role and the way most of my teammates view their roles is that we're advocating for the users of those technologies because we genuinely want to make things better. So yeah, again, you know, just advocating for the user to make things better. And I think that this, again, you know, um, developer advocacy has become kind of in vogue. Google has a really big uh, program, um, Amazon, uh, Facebook. Uh, I think Apple is even using the advocate term now. Obviously, Microsoft is doing it. You see it at smaller companies, larger companies. And that is kind of becoming the, you know, uh, the, the new way of, of doing things. And I think, and, and typically what happens is that the people who are the advocates come from the communities uh, that they're advocating for. So if, if you know you uh, use the programming language Go or, or, or JavaScript, um, someone from the Go community might be you know on the advocate team at, at Google or at Microsoft or or someplace else, and that that's done in part because you want to bring credibility to what's being done, and I think it's also because you need people who are advocating um, for the users who actually understand the core technology. So it works both ways. In my case. Um, I, I have a good grasp of, of you know, explaining things to people and, and, and kind of breaking things down and also understanding what types of content are effective and not. And so for me, even though I'm not an expert in all the areas that, that I kind of you know, uh, cover or, or talk about, what I'm trying to do is get the feedback about how easy it is to onboard or, or, or to use something or bottom line, just listen for feedback, even if it's not my area of expertise, so I can listen and kind of say, these are the issues that the people are having, and I can kind of be that champion for, uh, for the developer. So um, one of the interesting things is that advocacy isn't just about developers. It can be for, for users as well, and it can, it can cross between the two. Uh, at Google, for instance, they have a really broad advocacy program where they even have design advocates, where they have people who you know, actively work on and, and UX and UI and are advocating back to their teams who are making those decisions based on what they're hearing from the community. And, and this is hugely beneficial because you know, before I, I worked at a tech company, I thought that I understood the software development pro uh, process at a large, at a large company or, or even something smaller. And I did and I didn't. Um, it's actually funny because in some ways I was oftentimes um, in a similar position where I kind of worked in the middle between product and end and, and users when I was uh, in media because of my tech background, I could have more complex, uh, more direct conversations with our, our product teams when building on tools and I could maybe um, more adequately express why something wasn't working or why workflow would work better, for instance, and, and, and maybe why you know, a change they made to the CMS was a bad thing. And what you find is, is at first you think, oh, well, of course, the people building the products know how people are using the product. But that's not true, and it's not that they don't want the feedback or they're not kind of keeping their ears to the ground. But the way that software development cycles work is that um, you have things that are called, usually how it works in an agile system, is you have things called sprints. And in those sprints, you have a certain number of fixes that you need to do, and you have a certain number of features that you need to achieve. And you have a deadline, and the sprint might be two weeks. And each person is kind of assigned items, and they, they work on those items, and then they go on to the next sprint. 
And someone needs to ultimately talk to the, the, the product manager, or program manager, or whatever the case may be, and get a work item, get a change put to a sprint, or have a broader discussion if it's more than just a simple change to say, hey, we need to look about why this button is here, or why this sign up flow is here. And when you're in the middle of it and when you're just you know, coding those things, you might not be aware of everything that's happening by the people actually using your product. And you're so you know, obsessed with fixing the work that you have to do um, that the idea of making changes um, isn't necessarily top of mind. And in some cases, it is only until after a product is released that you actually see how people use it. And we see this with consumer technology all the time. I mean, I think Twitter is a great example where Twitter started out as an SMS-based system um, that was kind of a microblogging thing. That was what people called it for, for many years um, to kind of you know, send status updates. And then it, it morphed into um, you know, a, a true communications platform, um, largely because of how the users we're using Twitter. So like the hashtag, for instance, came from uh, Christopher Molina, who is, is now, uh, I think his startup is called Molly, but he's been at Google, and he was at Uber, and he's been um, at a lot of different places. But he was the person who started using the hashtag on Twitter in like 2006. And that became an official feature and a way to track um, uh, the, the same things people were saying. Um, the at message was the same thing as, as, a, as a notion of, of alerting someone with a certain username. That came from users. Um, the idea of uh, even the bird logo was something that a third party company came up with. And so, you know, um, they might have revisionist history now, but if you were to act, but if you were to, if, if Jack Dorsey, I think, and, uh, was to seriously answer the question about did he anticipate Twitter to be used the way it is now, you know, 12 years ago, the answer would be no. And, and um, it, to, to Twitter's credit, although they haven't done as good of a job lately, they were very, very good at morphing and updating their systems to fit the, 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 uh, the needs of their users and also their developers. And, and that's one of the reasons why um, it did have such early growth. Uh, Facebook is, is a little bit different insofar that it's always been largely, you know, kind of product driven by the people who are inside. But they have so much, but they get a lot of user data back as well to kind of figure out how people use things or if things are going to be popular or not. And, and, and they make changes based on those things too. So it's really common that you don't know how something's going to be used until it's out in the world. Um, but if you're working on something that is as nebulous as something like you know, a, a cloud service or, or support for a certain um, language or even something like, like UI and UX that can change all the time, it's really important to have people in the communities who can be talking directly with the developers and users so that you get that feedback and you make, can make things better. Not just so you know, the, the companies can, can be more successful, but so that the, what the users are getting out of it can be better too. You know, ultimately, um, you don't want to use something that, that, that has a bad experience, and, and you want to be able to use things to, to the, uh, the fulfillment of, of their potential. And so um, it can go across uh, disciplines. And, and I think that it's one of those things um, that when I, uh, when I was kind of taking on the role, um, again, I, I didn't give enough credence to the fact that um, even being able to tell the story and let people know what's going on can be vitally important, even if it's bad news. Just having that two-way communication is really, really important. Um, but one of the things is, is, you know, you can only talk so much. You know, talk is cheap and action has value. So um, our, our organization at Microsoft is about a year and a half old, and um, I would say that in the first year or so, we did a really good job of going into a lot of communities who have to be, you know, totally candid, not as, you know, um, opening and welcoming to, to using Microsoft tools and, and services, and maybe didn't even know that we would support, you know, Node.js and that we have a big, you know, Linux, uh, lots of Linux support on, on our cloud. They, they know Amazon, and, and that's what they use, and that's fine. Um, they might use you know, Google for, for certain things. They might not know about our offerings. And so um, a lot of, and, and then historically, especially when it comes to open source communities, Microsoft as a company had a really bad relationship with people um, building open source tools and using open source software. Um, and so as the company is, you know, it's, it's been uh, several years now that, that Satya Nadella has been CEO, and there's been this big shift happening internally at the company. Um, but externally, sometimes that message takes a long time to catch up. And so one of the, the challenges you have is that you have to go to communities and you have to talk to people and, and you want to let them know, hey, I'm here, I'm listening. Yes, I, I know that, that in 2002, you know, Steve Ballmer said that Linux was a cancer. But when we say that we love Linux and that we support open source, we mean it. 
that takes time to get people to be willing to listen and then even longer for them to, 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 to start to believe you. Uh, you know, Microsoft acquired GitHub, the, the code repository. The deal closed a couple of weeks ago, but when the deal was announced, um, Obviously, there were a lot of people who were worried and were scared, and I completely understand that. But what was impressive to me as, as an insider, somebody who now works at the company, was that the reaction um, was much less negative than I, than I think it would have been um, definitely five years ago, but, but maybe, but probably even two years ago. So the talking is working, but as, as you know, we talk about on our team a lot, Talking only does so much. We, we've done a really good job this first year of saying the right things to the right people and saying we hear you and we're taking your feedback back and we're, and we're gonna make things better and we're gonna make the changes you need. But the only way that really works and the only way people are going to continue to take you seriously and maybe shift their perceptions and tell you more things and, and, and work together is if you actually take action and actually make the change. And so that's the next kind of step in the journey and I think that's something that, that every uh, uh, company that has any sort of advocacy program deals with is you can't just talk, you have to actually make the action. And, and that's always harder. You know, doing is always harder um, than saying things. And, uh, but we're working towards it. And, and um, personally, I think that that's vital because if we don't do that, then our products don't get better um, and people won't use us. And, and whatever potential those products could unlock, that tooling, that technology, might not be used, and, and that, that's never a good thing. Um, but the dialogue has to be genuine, you know, so the, the way that, you know, I, I think about my approach, you know, just speaking for myself about talking with, with, our, with our customers, talking with our users, and my perception, I think, in the way that, that all these groups, you know, developers, uh, 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 users, uh, tech companies all need to communicate is actually having a dialogue, but it needs to be genuine. So if I'm saying, I want to hear your unvarnished feedback, and you tell me all the ways that you don't like something. Some of that might just be, you know, uh, subjective, and I might not be able to make any action item on it. But if it's something that I've worked really hard on, and that I know that the team behind has made some changes that are, are really important for a lot of reasons, I still need to be able to have that 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 uh, real, genuine dialogue. And sometimes that means explaining why something will not gain support, or why it works, or explaining hard things, and the only way you do that is by, by being honest. Um, developers especially can smell, uh, uh, you know, um, bullshit a mile away. And, excuse my language, but there was really no other word that I could use for that. So if you're not genuine with them, if you're just speaking in marketing speak, they're not going to pay attention. And, and I, the same thing is true for end users. You know, people know if something seems too good to be true, it is, and, and if you're just paying lip service, they know that. And so. The, the conversation has to be genuine. And at the same time, you know, um, customers and, and users have to actually tell companies the unvarnished truth, the good, bad, the bad, the ugly about what they're using. So if, if you get one of those annoying surveys, which can oftentimes be terribly designed, giving accurate feedback is important. Or if, if, if you, you might really like the person or, or, or like what they're doing a lot, but if you're just saying, no, oh, this is great, but you really have some concerns, that needs to be addressed. And the same, I think, even goes for non-developer uh, technologies. If there's something that makes you uncomfortable, if there's a data, you know, um, a practice that you're not familiar with, you know, that's something that, that uh, users need to have that genuine conversation with, with the people building the products and also the companies making the tools and, and whatnot to, um, to make sure that everybody's on the same page. Because if the dialogue isn't genuine, then I, I kind of don't understand why we're why we're having the conversation. Otherwise, it's just you know niceties. That's great, but nothing's going to get done. Um, and, and ultimately, you know, this this is comes down to trust, and that's one of the more difficult things. I think again, as I, as I was saying earlier in the talk, there is this push and pull right now where a lot of users, a lot of developers, don't trust big tech companies and or, or small tech companies, and where you know I know if I download an app and I don't know who the developer is, and they're asking for you know, access to my camera, my location data, and other things, there's valid reasons for me to be like, do I want to grant that if I don't know who this, who this company is, and if I also don't trust maybe the data protection practices of the person who makes the operating system on my phone. Um, and, and, or if I visit a website, the same thing. If I'm entering in information, if, if it doesn't have you know, uh, uh, you know, an HTTPS uh, logo, you know, a, a address when, when I'm logging in, if it's not a secure site, and I'm asked to enter in sensitive information, you know, that's usually a red flag. We teach people look for the look for the green padlock. Um, but even even when you have those things, people still there's there's a there's a lack of trust. And and again, as I said earlier, that's for good reason. But the only way we get past that, the only way I think that we can overcome things and we can start to have 
real candid uh, uh, you know, conversations that actually lead to better results is by um, being real with one another. And the only way you can, you can trust someone is if they uh, follow through on their word and um, if they uh, you know, continue to, to, to be honest over time. Uh, once that's eroded, it's really hard to rebuild. You know, I mean, I, I think about companies that have changed pricing on me with, without um, uh, you know, telling me in advance. I think about you know, a company like MoviePass, who you know, has changed their terms of service a million times. And, and you know, when I looked at the company, I was like, oh, this, this is never going to work. Um, but you buy into it anyway. And how could anybody who would sign up for MoviePass today trust that the terms they're signing up for are going to be consistent when the past shows that they haven't. And so um, it's, it's important uh, to, uh, to understand that. And, and I think that for, for users, it's also important to understand that um, if, if you don't trust a company, um, it's completely valid to vote with your wallet and to, to vote with your voice and to say, I'm not going to partake in this. Sometimes that's easier said than done, right? Like a, a lot of the, the things that we rely on might be dependent on, on much bigger companies. And that's a, that's a broader issue. But those are still things that, that can be um, expressed. And, and um, hopefully, we can get to a place where we have more access uh, to people to have these conversations. Um, but you know, transparency, uh, trust, it doesn't mean sharing everything, right? Like, as an end user, I don't need to know the intricacies of, of a company's business plans or why they've decided to you know, build an array a certain way and, and why um, you know, they made a, a certain decision. If something failed and their decision that they made beforehand was, was responsible for that failure and that's lost me you know, um, uh, time um, getting things done and using uh, my tools, then maybe I want some background information. But I don't need the entire story. I don't need to know where everything is going and I don't need to know everything that went into the, into the decision. I just need to know what reality is and what's happening at this moment. And um, at the same time, you know, I think that being transparent with our developers and with our users doesn't mean telling them things like, we're going to make everything better, especially if it won't, or going into maybe some of the bureaucratic reasons why something hasn't worked before. That doesn't really help anybody. You know, um, sharing uh, is uh, sharing everything. You know, it's just kind of like with your friends. like. There are some things I just don't want to know and that aren't helpful for me to know, but there are some things that are, are vitally important that we need to have as part of our relationship. And so I think that's an important distinction to make, especially when we have these conversations, is that transparency is important, but transparency doesn't mean sharing everything. Because A, some people don't care. Sometimes it's irrelevant. And, and sometimes it can be actively harmful in ways that we might not think about. So transparency and sharing uh, doesn't equal sharing everything. But ultimately, um, and, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take questions in, in, in just a little bit, I'm done a little bit early, but um, this is how things get better. And I think ultimately, when we, when we talk about having these conversations and why these two groups should talk, you know, developers and their users need to talk because you need to know how your users are using your products. And if you're, especially if you're, you're using things that are, that are kind of cutting edge or that are complicated, um, why they're choosing to use your product and how you can make things better. And if you're a big tech company, you need to know um, what your developers' concerns are and, and what their pain points are because that's how we can ultimately make the products better and, and, and evolve. And so, you know, to kind of go back to what I was saying before, I, I used to spend a lot of time kind of explaining how things work. And now I feel like I, I do a lot of time listening and trying to then explain to the people who are actually, you know, making those changes what what might uh, be beneficial and, and what might not be beneficial. Um, but I also have to sometimes go back and, and relay things to users and say, OK, we weren't able to make this the way you wanted it. And maybe this isn't the perfect thing for you, because there's no one size, you know, it, it, one size fits all doesn't exist. And there are always going to be things that might work well for, for me, but don't work well for your use case. Um, and explaining, you know, this wasn't a priority because, or this isn't technically feasible because, or we have to make a choice between A and B. And I think the, the when people are aware of those conversations and are aware of what decisions go into that, and the fact that a decision is being made at all, people are much more willing to understand why, you know, uh, a, a certain feature might not work or why it takes a really long time um, for something to do something. Um, and, and at the same time, you know, um, the more data that we can get back and the more direct feedback we can get from the people who are using our tools, um, I, either as end users or developers, the more we can do to make sure that we're fulfilling those needs. And um, it's also important to think about, you know, 
getting ideas for how you can create the next big thing. And, and I think especially when it comes to emerging technologies where people don't necessarily know how to, to, to use what they're doing, um, it's sort of interesting. You know, I look at like um, augmented reality and virtual reality and that's a really interesting space. And you know, VR hasn't taken off in the consumer way the way a lot of tech companies expected that it would. You know, Facebook bought Oculus for $2 billion. HTC, um, you know, uh, at, at, you know, made big um, investments in, in its Vive platform. Uh, PlayStation, you know, Sony um, ha has its systems. Samsung has put, you know, tens of billions of dollars in its headsets. But it's still a novelty, and we haven't really seen the real use cases. And part of me wonders if that's because what we've been showing users were just kind of these one-off things, like, oh, it's gaming. And then everybody just gets in their mind, well, that's the only way people can use this. And so sometimes, you know, I think the, uh, the fear sometimes is about, you know, by leading, by, by just telling people this is how you use something, is that if you get the idea in people's heads, well, this is how I do it. And, and instead, I think uh, the bigger opportunity is to um, talk about what the potential might be and then to listen for what things people might want, what experiences and tools people might want to build, and then figure out how to make that happen. So, um, but uh, if anybody has any questions, I, I, I don't know, you're free uh, to, to, to ask, um, and even including, you know, transitioning from, from tech to media or anything else, uh, just let me know, but yeah. Uh, thank you so much for your thoughts on how developers need to talk to their users. And I think earlier in your presentation, you talked a little bit about how um, you know, you've gotten a little bit lucky in talking to the right users and getting that feedback. But so a company like Microsoft, or even like any big company for that, for that matter, has such a wide audience. How do yeah. you decide like, which particular users to talk to? Or how do you like, choose the correct audience to talk to in order to get the feedback for the developers? That's a great question, and, and I wish that there was an easy answer. Sometimes technology itself can help, and so a big part of that actually, um, you know, a lot of what we do in our, in our organization is, you know, in-person um, communications, but we also create online content. And so I think that the best way to do that is to make it as easy as possible for people to submit their feedback and to submit their ideas. So that means making it clear that if you have a Twitter presence, that you're open to feedback and that you're listening. Um, our, all of our documentation at this point is on, is on GitHub. And what's great about that is the old doc system would often become outdated or things wouldn't be correct or people would have a question about how it worked. And there might be a button someplace that you could file a bug report and, and send in a request and it would go into a hole someplace and somebody might get to it. But using GitHub, um, which the, the team has been doing for years, and this happened well before the, the acquisition, um, you know, it now shows up in, in the documentation team's uh, pull request bar. So they see the issues that are filed, and they can even see if someone wants to submit a fix. And that's a great way to get insight. Uh, but also monitoring various you know, communities, things like Stack Overflow, uh, Reddit, uh, Twitter, um, Discord. And, and trying to keep ears to the ground. But I think the, the most important thing, because you're right, it's hard to figure out what, what types of people to listen to, and it can be hard to kind of hone in on that feedback. But the most important thing um, is to make it easy for people to give that feedback. I think that's paramount. Once you get the feedback, the way of sorting it is a lot easier, but it's just getting it all in one place to begin with. And that's, that's the challenge. And that's something, frankly, we, Microsoft hasn't always done super well, but we're trying to improve. And that's something I think that the easier you can make it to, to communicate back, um, the better things will be. All right, thank you. Hi, I have a little bit of a follow-up to that in the sure. reverse. Um, it's been my experience with highly technical people that they usually think that they know they're doing the right thing. How is it that you're translating what the consumer is saying to the technical person and actually convincing them to make a change? Great question. Um, and sometimes that means uh, being you know, direct and saying this, this is not good. This is, this is why people aren't using this. This is not good. Um, but, but more broadly, I think that it comes down to, a lot of it is you know, kind of uh, interpersonal skills and people skills and getting to know people on that team, getting them to trust you so that if they're hearing your feedback, they know that it's coming from a place of, I just want to make things better, and I'm not you know, disagreeing with you, or I'm not criticizing what you're doing. Because that's oftentimes the hardest thing when you, when you talk with product people is they've worked really hard. And you don't want them to think, oh, what you've built is terrible, and I hate it. Um, it just might be 
this is something that isn't working as expected or this behavior might be better. And so sometimes it's about framing, sometimes it's about being direct, but, but you're right. I mean, that's, it, it, it's, it's a challenging thing and I think that's something that we're still kind of figuring out. But um, I know I always go to the product teams first and foremost with the uh, you know, outlook of, I wanna help you. I wanna be as helpful to you as possible, whether that means creating content you know, for our audiences that show off things you've built that you're really excited about, a story that's not being told, but you think this is really cool, let me know and I can tell that story. Or you, know, you aren't getting the sorts of, of insights about how things are happening, I wanna be able to be that ear for you and, and distill it down. So I think a lot of it is, is uh, um, going into it with a place of, of openness and saying I, I'm here to help, I'm not here to criticize. But yeah, sometimes if, if something's just really bad, people need to be told that it's really bad. Well, if there are no more questions, uh, I know Christina will be sticking around for a few minutes. Yes. For people that didn't vote, but kind of come down and say their questions public, perhaps, all right? But all right, thank you very much. Grateful, thank you very much. Thank you so much.